as the Supreme Court hears arguments today on the Obama health care law, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand will be watching very closely. Since taking over Hillary Clinton's Senate seat, she has made a name for herself, working to help 9-11 responders and to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And just this past week, the senator made headlines talking about Afghanistan and the 2016 presidential race, and she joins us in the studio. Hello. Very good to see you, Senator Hi, John Brand. You did make he headlines talking about Afghanistan, and you were talking about the withdrawal as quickly as possible. Yeah. Do you think that that's likely? Well, I think what we need is a, a shift in strategy. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that we recognize where the threats that we face come from. And Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is becoming the far more dangerous place for Al-Qaeda. I think we've, our troops have done an extraordinary job in Afghanistan. They've completed their mission. We've killed Osama bin Laden. But I do believe Al-Qaeda has metastasized, and I think it is an internationally remotely located organization. The last terror attempts have come from Somalia and Yemen and Pakistan. Should we be do, doing both, though? I believe we need to shift our strategy to a more anti-terrorism strategy, uh, more targeted missions, special operations missions. We don't need 90,000 American troops on the ground, I think, to complete the mission we have of so, keeping America safe. So 23 are coming home, mm -hmm. uh, 23,000. Those are the surge troops. That will leave about 68,000 American troops. You want to draw down those 68,000 how much faster than the president intends to draw them down? I think they need to come home sooner rather than later. Uh, in the next six months, the, over the, a year? Yeah, the commanders on the ground can make the judgments about how many troops on what day, in what direction. But what I am trying to call for is a shift in strategy, in, as opposed to a current strategy of counterinsurgency, okay, but, but which are you is happy, broad -based. Are you happy to leave it to the commanders on the ground? If they say we need 68,000 <laughs> until uh, 2014, you're happy with that decision? They need to make recommendations about how quickly you can draw down troops when you've changed your strategy. There's such a fundamental difference between a counterinsurgency strategy, which is broad-based, supporting the local government, doing uh, nation building, to a counterterrorism strategy, which is targeted, special ops missions, like the mission to get Osama bin Laden. That requires far fewer troops. It relies on drones. It relies on other technologies. And so what the commanders do is say, if that is our new strategy, this is the number of troops that will take over this amount of time at any given and, and they would determine how many troops can come home as quickly as possible but what I'm calling for is that shift in strategy mm -hmm. because I think our risks are far broader based and experts do agree that Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is the, the graver threat to America right now and I don't think you know we started our strategy in Afghanistan because they launched the 9-11 attacks from Afghanistan because it had a base of operations mm -hmm. because it had a foothold a training ground I don't think Al Qaeda needs those things anymore to launch attacks and so our current strategy of this broad-based counterinsurgency, I think, should be shifted. Oh, we have a number of topics we want to get to. Yes. I, want to I want to check in with you on health care. We were speaking with uh, Governor Howard Dean about this earlier this morning. He said he doesn't think the individual mandate will stand and that the law will work just fine without it, that there are plenty of other things in it which he called good that would work. Do you believe it can stand without the individual mandate? I do. I think you can find your way there. What I really am concerned about is I really wish the American people could be watching this proceeding. I think we need transparency in this branch of government, too. You want too. cameras in You should have too. cameras Good in the courtroom. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Dick yes. Durbin, Chuck Grassley have been fighting for this for a long time. And I think it makes perfect sense. So I was very disappointed with just a few days ago when Chief Judge Roberts decided that he was not going to allow cameras in the courtroom. This decision fundamentally affects every single American. Right. I think they should be part of the, the discussion. Discussion, the questions being asked, hearing the answers in real time, to be engaged. That's what we want. We want more people to care about our democracy, to be voting, to be being heard, to be leaning into these issues. And I think transparency and accountability in this branch of government would also benefit. The one thing that, uh, that really strikes me about you is your passion for teen driving. I am so interested in this topic, even though I no longer have teenagers in the house. I don't think people understand how many kids die every year in car crashes that really could be prevented. Well, what you are know, you doing the, about the, that? The most sobering statistic is 11 kids die every single day. Every day. Every single day. And imagine teenagers today. What are they doing? They're texting. texting. They're, they're speeding. Online. They're on the phone. And it's the distracted driving that is really the killer. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is give teens a longer time to learn how to drive, to avoid the riskier situations longer. Does that mean raising the driving age from? No, they, they still can get their learner's permit at, four, at, 16. at 16. Some states are as young as 14. But what we want to do is things like driving at night 
or driving with other kids in the car. We want to delay those experiences so the, the kids are ready, so they have better judgment, so they have a bit more experience, because those are the circumstances when we see these tragedies. Kids coming home late from the prom, yes. six kids in the car, distracted driving. Mm -hmm. And Senator, as you know, they travel in little packs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very rare that teens are in the car alone. Mm -hmm. So they travel in packs, the radio's turned up loud, they're dancing, they're singing in the car, and they really do think that they're invincible. Mm -hmm. I think anything that could change that is a good thing. So we just want to delay the time in which they take on the, the more risky um, but what circumstances. You get, you get your license. So, you can get your license at 16, but it's a graduated license. So at 17, you get certain privileges. At 18, you get right. certain privileges. But not until you're 18 do you get to do everything, drive at all times with whatever passengers you need. Um, I need to ask you this, but before we let you go, um, you've said that you'd love to see Hillary Clinton run yeah. for president in 2016. She's basically said a number of times, I I'm know. not in. We can always hope. Um, you know, S Secretary Clinton has been such a role model to me personally. Yes. Um, I remember when I was a young lawyer sitting behind a desk watching her give that speech in China when she was first lady, when she said women's rights are human rights and I human rights are women's too. rights. Yes. And when I heard her say that, I had been an Asian studies major. I learned Chinese. I'd been to Beijing. That was such a transformational moment for the first lady to create a call to action in China where girl babies were still being killed in the countryside. For her to say that mm -hmm. to me was transformational. And so I thought I really need to, you know, if I was ever going to be on a stage like that calling for human rights, I'd have to be involved in politics. And that really encouraged me to get my start. And but her response to you floating that out there was? I, I haven't read, actually, your response yet. <laughs> but, you know, I, I want more women in government. I, I want, you know, we still only have 17% women yes. in Congress. Mm -hmm. We only have six governors. Secretary Clinton has been an extraordinary leader and role model uh, for me personally and for women and girls all across this world. So I was just really saying I couldn't think of a better person. Um, but, but, but that's been a mission for a long time. We need more women in leadership roles. I think we have better outcomes when women and men are at the table making these tough decisions. Plus, women I have... know you and Gabby Giffords are good friends. I know we got to go, Erica. I know. But have you talked to her recently? Can you just give us a brief update? She's OK. She's, She's great. I, when I saw her when she came to give her resignation, she was so at peace with her decision. She yeah. knew it was the right decision. She knew it was best for her constituents. And I can tell you, she is so strong, so courageous, uh, but full, uh, full of love and, and caring for others. And her decision was largely informed by wanting to do what's best for her constituents. Got it. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, really nice to have Great you at the table with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.